Today, we are going to the early 20th century. So sit back as we go to Canada. Emilio Piccarello was born in the 1870s in the small town of Capria, which is situated about 60 kilometers outside Naples in southern Italy. In 1899, he joined the increasing number of Italians who migrated to North America in search of prosperity and better employment opportunities. At first, he went to the USA, where he worked as an electrician and a laborer. And in 1900, he met and married a young Italian lady named Maria Marusi, who was working as a housekeeper in the boarding house where Emilio was staying. The couple worked hard and by 1902, they had saved enough money to start their own business and went to Toronto where they bought a small grocery store. Emilio had always wanted to work for himself. He thought that the best way of making money was by being in control of his own destiny. And although the grocery store was a success, it never gave him the wealth and lifestyle he sought. Over the next few years, the couple had seven children. Then suddenly in 1911, Emilio decided to sell the store and move. He didn't just move a few miles away. He moved over 3000 kilometers, setting up home in Fernie in British Columbia. This was very different to Toronto as Fernie was a very small, picturesque town encircled by the Rocky Mountains. He soon found work at the local macaroni factory. Being employed again had its advantages, but it was difficult to suppress Emilio's enterprising nature. And when the macaroni factory closed to move to a larger building in Lethbridge, Emilio spoke to the owner and agreed to rent the premises. He first started a business where his staff would roll cigars ready for him to sell. This was profitable, but he wanted something more lucrative, so stumbled on the idea of manufacturing ice cream. When the ice cream was made, he would sell it to the public and to ice cream parlors, but realizing he could be both the wholesaler and the retailer, he soon established his own ice cream parlors in the town of Trail and Blairmore and the business soon started to flourish. He sometimes accepted payments in the form of bottles, which he would sell to the bottlers. And by 1916, he had become known locally as the Bottle King. He would place advertisements in newspapers saying that he paid top prices for empty bottles. On July the 1st, 1916, the neighboring state of Alberta introduced prohibition which prohibited the sale of alcohol. Emilio saw this as another way of making money and wanted to be part of the bootlegging trade, which quickly developed, involving the transportation of alcohol from neighboring states where there was no prohibition, such as British Columbia and the US state of Montana. They would then sell it illegally to the local community in Alberta. Emilio soon started transporting illegal alcohol into Alberta through the route known as the Crow's Nest Pass. On October the 1st, 1917, the state of British Columbia also introduced prohibition, so Emilio decided to move to Blairmore in Alberta. This was because he wanted to be closer to Montana, which at the time still allowed the sale of alcohol, and it was also very close to the distilleries and breweries in British Columbia where he purchased all of his alcohol. Even though British Columbia had introduced prohibition banning the consumption of alcohol, it did not ban the production of it. So although some breweries and distilleries produced less, they still continued to operate. Alcohol consumption was still legal on medical grounds. So anyone who had a perceived medical need and who could convince a doctor to write them a prescription would be allowed to continue drinking alcohol. Emilio needed a base for his operation, so he purchased the Alberta Hotel in Blairmore. Soon after he purchased the hotel, 
he excavated a room under it and dug a tunnel leading to the road outside. This made it easier for his illegally smuggled alcohol to be transported and stored in the cellar. He knew that the best way to cover up his illegal activities was to be a well-respected citizen. He was elected alderman of Blairmore and distributed sacks of flour to poor families. During World War I, he also purchased £5,000 worth of victory bonds and when the local coal miners went on strike in 1918, he contributed money to their families. He soon became a well-liked and well-respected resident of the town. Florence Lissandro arrived in Canada from Italy in 1909 with her parents, brother and sister. They settled in Fernie, where her father found work as a coal miner. When she was 14 years old, she married 23-year-old fellow Italian Carlo Sanfidelli. And shortly after the wedding, the couple decided to move to Pennsylvania in search of better opportunities. Their USA adventure didn't last long and they soon returned to Canada and went to live in Blairmore. On their return, they changed their name to Lissandro, probably because they had either entered the USA illegally or committed a crime there and thought that changing their name would avoid any future prosecution. Her husband returned to work for his previous employer, the well-known and well-respected local businessman, Emilio Picarello. Before Carlo married, he worked for Emilio, selling cigars and ice cream. At this time he was employed as a chauffeur and then he was given the job of manager of the recently purchased Alberta Hotel. Florence then started working as a waitress. On July the 1st, 1919, prohibition was introduced to the US state of Montana, which meant there was a far greater market for Emilio and the other bootleggers to operate in. Never wanting to miss an opportunity, Emilio purchased two McLaughlin 6 Specials. These vehicles were great in a chase and could outrun any car that the police had. They were commonly referred to as Whiskey Sixes and anyone who owned one was often looked at with suspicion. The Alberta Provincial Police would set up checkpoints in McCrow's Nest Pass and check vehicles travelling from British Columbia into Alberta so Emilio developed ways of avoiding detection. He would put the alcohol in the car but surround it with sacks of flour. So if a car was stopped and searched, the police would find flour and not search every inch of the goods being transported. He would also often have two cars in convoy, with the first being empty and the second filled with alcohol. So if the first car was stopped at the checkpoint, the second would turn round and find another route into Alberta. Prohibition also led to the growth of small distilleries and breweries, which often operated in people's homes. There was also an increase in alcohol robberies. Freight trains were robbed in transit, and with the increase in alcohol production and the increase in crime, pressure was put on the police to tighten control. The police started to prosecute bootleggers and in 1921, Emilio was arrested and fined $20 after the Alberta Provincial Police found four barrels of alcohol in his warehouse. Then in January 1922, they found 70 barrels of beer in a railway carriage with a bill of landing in his name. He claimed that the beer had been sent in error as he had ordered carbonated water, but the judge didn't believe him and he was fined $500. The interest in him by the Alberta Provincial Police did not have any effect on his determination to trade illegal alcohol and he replaced his McLaughlin 6s with the new, faster McLaughlin 7s. He found even more industrious ways of avoiding detection. He often sent his son on the bootleg runs with Florence Lissandro. She was of similar age to Emilio's son and they looked like a young, innocent couple out for an afternoon drive which was good cover when they came across one of the many police roadblocks. Emilio's bootlegging activities were no secret in the local community, where he was fondly known as Emperor Pick. He always seemed to stay 
one step ahead of the law. Alberta needed a new approach in apprehending the local smugglers, so decided to recruit more police constables and enforce more roadblocks. In March 1922, the very experienced Steve Lawson joined the Alberta Provincial Police Force. He was known to be a strategic and very well organised police officer. He arrived in Canada from England in 1903, settling in McLeod. He worked briefly for the Royal Northwest Mounted Police before joining the McLeod Police Force. He fought in World War I, where he was awarded the Military Medal for Valour before returning to McLeod and becoming Chief of Police in 1919. He then became Chief of Police in Fernie, British Columbia in May 1920. His credentials were outstanding and the Alberta Provincial Police considered themselves fortunate to have such an experienced police officer in their ranks. He was posted to Coleman in the Crow's Nest Pass. On September the 21st, 1922, Emilio was on one of his bootlegging runs using a convoy of three cars driven by himself, his mechanic named Jay McAlpine and his son named Stefano. Unbeknown to Emilio, the police in Blairmore had received a tip off that he was about to transport illegal alcohol into Alberta from British Columbia. This was good for the police and they were determined to catch and arrest Emilio. Police officer Stephen Lawson was stationed at the border town of Coleman and when the convoy arrived, he radioed to his counterparts in Blairmore that the convoy was on its way. When they arrived at the Alberta Hotel, two police officers were waiting and handed Emilio a search warrant. They may, however, have been a bit premature as the alcohol had not been unloaded, so Emilio alerted his son, who immediately turned his car around and headed back to British Columbia. The police officers radioed to Steve Lawson in Coleman that Estefano was on his way back to British Columbia. As the car entered the main street in Coleman, the local police signalled for it to stop, but Estefano just kept on driving, so Officer Steve Lawson fired two shots, the first a warning shot, which had no effect on persuading the driver to stop, so he aimed the second shot at the car, and the bullet hit Estefano on the hand, but he still did not stop. The police started to chase him, but their cars were far slower, so they soon abandoned their pursuit. When news of the incident reached Emilio, he immediately went to the Coleman police barracks. He was accompanied by Florence Lissandro, and both were very worried about the condition of a Stefano. Emilio started to speak to Officer Lawson. At first, the two men had an amiable conversation, but it soon turned into an argument followed by a physical confrontation. Suddenly two shots were fired from the direction of Emilio's car, both of which missed their target, but as the policeman turned away, a third shot was fired, which hit him in the back. An officer, Steve Lawson, was killed. Emilio and Florence quickly got back in the car and drove away. Not wanting to return to Blairmore, Emilio and Florence spent the night of September the 21st in a shed in a field. The following day, September the 22nd, Emilio went into the hills and Florence went into hiding. The police now considered them to be fugitives and a large manhunt began, which involved police officers from across central and southern Alberta. It did not take long for the police to track Emilio down and soon afterwards, Florence handed herself in they were arrested and charged with murder. On the 2nd of October 1922, they had their first hearing in the Coleman Opera House, a strange venue, but it was used as it was the only building in the town able to accommodate the number of spectators who wanted to attend. The outcome was that a joint trial was set to be held in McLeod. The defence argued that the clients may not get a fair trial in McLeod and the judge changed the trial location to the court in Calgary. Emilio employed a highly accomplished legal team to act for both him and his co-defendant. The trial attracted massive media attention 
not only locally, but also across Canada. Different theories emerged as to what happened on the 21st of September 1922. One was that when Officer Lawson realised that Emilio was armed, he physically attacked him. And when he did this, Florence shot him. Another was that Emilio shot him when trying to flee the scene. The defence, however, tried to convince the court that due to the angle of the impact from the bullet, neither Emilio or Florence could have fired the fatal shot and it must have been delivered by an unknown third party. The theory, however, while interesting, was not backed up by any supporting evidence, nor could the claim that the shooting was in self-defence. The trial lasted for six days before the jury returned with the verdict of guilty. Both Emilio and Florence were sentenced to death by hanging. An appeal was submitted to the Supreme Court in Alberta, which was dismissed. So the defence submitted a further appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada, but again, the original sentence was upheld. Florence sent a telegram to the Justice Minister via the prison chaplain, but no reprieve or commuting of her sentence was granted. Emilio and Florence were executed on May the 2nd, 1923. Emilio's last words were, you are hanging an innocent man. One year later, on May the 10th, 1924, prohibition came to an end in Alberta. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As per usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I will see you in the next brief case